Well, I would say if you have your Bibles, you can open up to this area, but I'm actually going to be kind of skipping around a little bit this morning. The first place we're going to go to is Matthew chapter 5, so you can go there as well. I'm not starting a new series this morning, but I am going to talk about something that has kind of bothered me for the past, well, several years, but kind of typified on my way back from a vacation. By the way, thank you for, uh, for allowing us to go on vacation for the past couple Sundays. We really enjoyed it. It was a time of relaxing. And also thank you to Brother Doug, who uh, filled in for me last week. I had uh, a hernia surgery. Uh, Doug did a phenomenal job. I said, you know, Doug, I said, you, I said, you called out more, uh, more people than I do on a normal Sunday morning. I said, you had every single person out there. And, uh, but he did a phenomenal job, you know, and uh, I was glad, you know, it was God ordered that whole, orchestrated that whole thing because it was great um, between that and uh, learning about, you know, how we're praying on Sunday nights as well. But like I say, there's something that on the way back that I, I've seen, uh, you know, that I saw on a big, huge billboard. And I was like, okay, in my mind, I'm going, people cannot be this, cannot be this ignorant of these things. And it, uh, it but it sat there, and I, it just, you know, fueled like a you know, holy anger in me because of the fact of what's been going on over the past several years and, the, you know, the things that I have noticed over the past couple, you know, times. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to answer this question of who is the real Jesus? Who is the real Jesus? This morning, as, you know, I'd like to go through the scripture and answer a few questions to put to rest some false arguments and false accusations made about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe that these false ideologies to be damning about who the real Jesus Christ is. And this morning, I don't know, you know, I may not get as, I'm, I'm, I'm controlling myself as much as I possibly can because the thing is, is that I'm not necessarily feeling 100% yet. And I, um, I told my wife, usually if I get really excited or if I start raising my voice, then things start to hurting, all right? So, I, you know, so you'll have to see the times, you know, you know, where, you know, but this whole entire thing I am extremely passionate about. I may not let, you know, necessarily show it because I'm trying to hold it in. But sometimes I may get out, all right? I'll just tell you that. So the first question I want to answer is this question. You say, well, I've never asked, asked this question, but I can guarantee that there's been a lot of people that have asked this question. Was Jesus a sissy, and was he a cross-dresser? And you say, well, where, does he come, where do you come up with this, Pastor? Where are you going? Well, let me, let me lay the foundation on this you know, one for a little bit, because there's the, I think most people think that when Jesus came, that he came to destroy the law, and kept on moving on through. No, the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, so everything about Jesus Christ was to fulfill the law. He wasn't here to destroy the Old Testament. He, was come to, he came to fulfill the Old Testament. So you can look at it this way. Everything in the Old Testament is still pertinent today except for ceremonial laws, okay? Your ceremonial, you know, the, the moral law is still there, you know, and all these, you know, a lot of the civil laws are still there. The civil laws would be the things that we follow every day, like you shouldn't murder somebody. That is still applicable today. Or if you want to go even deeper, the Bible says that you should not sleep with your aunt, okay? So there's those kind of things. We think that those are still good today, right? Like those things are still good. So the thing is, is that, People think, I think people nowadays think that Jesus, you know, whatever Jesus said in the New Testament, that's it. We don't have to follow the Old Testament anymore. All right? And they look at the Old Testament as that that's old. God's doing something new. He did it in the New Testament. And so they had this, you know, the strain ideology. And what I'm getting, you know, uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is, you know, so you may be asking, what does uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 have to do with what the question that I'm, you know, that I asked you this morning? Well, oftentimes, when you see a picture, you know, people say, well, here's a picture of Jesus. What picture do they show of Jesus? They show some white guy with long hair and a dress. Okay? You say, well, no, they don't. Yes, they do. Every single picture that you ever see of Jesus, let me tell you this, and I'm going to say this right out in the open, there is no picture of Jesus. There was no Polaroid cameras. Nobody was going around clicking them and going, that's Jesus right there. Nobody was around painting Jesus. None of that. So there is no picture of Jesus. So all these pictures that you have out there of Jesus, maybe that you have them at your house, I would say to just get rid of them and destroy them because all of those pictures are Catholic. The Catholic you know, uh, church came up with all those, and all the ones that painted them, are, they were Catholic at the time. You know, they were Catholic while they were painting them. 
And they came out during the Renaissance time, in which people say, oh, that was the Enlightenment period. I would call that the Endarkment period, because that's when you saw a lot of feminine you know, qualities coming out in men. And so what do they do? They go after Jesus, make him look like a woman, and put him in a dress. And so you say, well, you know, Pastor, he had to have long hair, because that's what the Jewish law says. No, the Jewish law says that men have short hair, and women have long hair, right? And so why would Jesus all of a sudden have long hair and go against his own law that he said? Okay, if you don't believe me, the, the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is what Paul writes about this. He's quoting, he's talking about you know, the law that was back in the Old Testament. He says this, he says, but I would have you know that uh, the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man and uh, the head of Christ is God. Every man uh, praying and prophesying Having his head cover dishonors his head. The part that he's talking about him covering his head is the fact of his hair, having long hair. Okay? So he's saying that's a dishonor. So if you pray and you have long hair, it says it actually dishonors your head. It actually is a dishonor to you. It says, but every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, saying short hair, uh, dishonors her head, for, uh, for that is even all one as if she were what? Shaven. So that's how we know it's hair. I mean, it's not the fact that we're, you know, we're talking about some head covering and all of a sudden they shave the, the head covering. That doesn't make sense. It says, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it, it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. So they're saying at that point, if you're, uh, if you're a woman and you have short hair, then cover your head. It says, For a man... Indeed, ought not, uh, ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, for the, uh, the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for woman, but the woman for the man. So in other words, what is he saying? Men are to have short hair, women are to have long hair. And you say, well, what constitutes short or what constitutes long? We all know, you know what a guy's hair you know, should be. I'm not saying everybody should have a haircut like mine. I'm saying that, you know, uh, you know, that people should be able to recognize that you're a man. And that if you're a woman, they should be able to recognize that you're a woman. Because there's oftentimes, I, I kid you not, I've been at a place and I have no idea what gender they are by their haircut. And that's what the Bible is saying. So in other words, what is he saying here? Jesus would not, Jesus would not tell you not to do something, but then all of a sudden he goes ahead and says, you know, it's okay for me to do it. Jesus had short hair. He tells all you know, men to have short hair. He says ladies to have long hair. I'm not saying for ladies to you know, grow your hair down to your behind. I'm not saying you know, for you to do that. But uh, you know, a, a man should be able to tell, you're a woman. And I think the reason why we see this is even more prevalent is because of nowadays. You have all this LGBT stuff out there that, that have all these different ones where they're trying to change genders and do whatever they want to. They want, they want to play a fantasy world and say, you know what, I'm not actually really a man. I'm actually a girl. No, you're not. The biology says that you're something different. All right, but that, the reason why I bring this up is because Je- all those pictures of Jesus are wrong. They're flat out wrong. Jesus did not have long flowing locks. He didn't have a beauty pageant sash either. Okay, just so you know. The other part is, is you know, the fact is, you know, like I say, is is that we see obviously that Paul is making a clear distinction that you know the more hair you have on your head is a covering as far as for a woman. A man is you know is dishonored to have long hair, and a woman is dishonored if she uh, if her head is short or shaven. All right, I'm not referring to the fact because I know. Speaking of, like, say, my mom. My mom, you know, has had cancer for the past year. She has had chemo. I am not saying that she's dishonoring her head right now. You know what? The chemo took it out. I can guarantee right now if you were to ask my mom, would you rather have the short hair? I can actually tell you this because I talked to her the other day. Because somebody said, hey, you, you, somebody told my mom, you look good in short hair. And my mom goes, no, I need to have long hair. I am not referring to somebody that has a medical condition or something else like that and saying that they're all of a sudden going to hell or something like that or they're just honoring God you know, for a woman if all of a sudden you know, they have short hair because they have some sort of disease that causes them not to. I don't want you to sit there and think, well, Pastor, you're being a jerk because you know, so-and-so had chemo or this or this. No, I'm talking about the fact of somebody purposely going, Zzz. that's what I'm saying. Like I said, you should be able to tell God made two genders, right? We should be able to tell what you are by your hair, at least. There's been some, honestly, I thought, I said, man, that girl's got some you know, great hair. Turns around, it's a dude. 
just want to take a zzz and go over the back over top of it. The other thing is, is that Jesus wore pants and not a dress. You see those in the same thing. You see the same thing as, as they're going around. He's got this, this, oh, well, it's a long cloak. No, a cloak is a jacket. It's a coat. It's like an overcoat. It would be like if I'm wearing a, you know, if I'm wearing a, a, a trench coat or something like that because I have a suit on, what, it comes to your knees, right? It's something like that. That is what they're talking about in that, or a mantle in, uh, in these things. But, you know, we'll see this right here in Exodus chapter uh, 28. Exodus chapter 28, starting at verse 42, it says, And thou shalt make them linen breeches. That word breeches actually means breeches or trousers. So God is telling the priests to wear what? Pants. It says, to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto their thighs, they, uh, they shall reach. And they shall, uh, they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons uh, when uh, they come in into, uh, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. Or uh, when, they, uh, when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they may bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statue forever unto him and his seed after him. So why would God tell the men, tell the priests, tell God's people, say, you know what, men, you're supposed to wear pants. But yet Jesus all of a sudden is like, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to break all kinds of things and just wear, you know, wear a dress. Jesus did not wear a dress. Jesus wore pants. And I know if you say, you know what, but all these pictures, pastor, there's all these pictures. They have to know. They were written, when did they paint those? When is the Renaissance period? It was not near, it was like a thousand years or, you know, even 1,500 years after Christ was around on the earth. It was not around, so they have no idea what he looked like. This was somebody's rendering of, of a feminine Jesus. That's what, you know, that's what the whole thing is. So Jesus wore pants. The men are supposed to wear pants. And what does it say? It says, what, they're supposed to cover your thighs. And so I'm sorry because I know this, is, this was an old-fashioned, I saw it growing up. Because my dad and a few others, I saw guys wearing like really short shorts. Man, let that style not come back. I ain't wearing them. I'll tell you that right now. I like the ones right now that come down to my knees. Like it says in the Bible, it says it's supposed to cover your thigh. I ain't interested in seeing you know, some short shorts, a guy wearing Daisy Dukes. I'm not interested in seeing a girl wearing Daisy Dukes, let alone a guy. And by the way, the Bible says for the woman, the woman is to cover her thigh as well. So it's the fact, they actually call that nakedness as well. So if a lady's going, well, I can just wear whatever I want, because pastor just said it was only for the men to cover. No, the girls are supposed to cover their thighs as well. The Bible talks about that in Isaiah chapter 47. But see, this is the whole thing is, and that you, you know the, the, the long dresses that, that they wear actually in the Middle East, do you know where they, that came from, that idea, that, that whole idea? That some men wore these long dresses. It came about around the time of the advent of Islam. Islam is the one that, you know, first started this, you know, this wicked religion started the fact of men wearing these, like, long dresses as a part of religion. And so it's not a part of Christianity. It's never been a part of that. So for somebody that says, you know what, Jesus wore, you know, wore a dress. No, he didn't. Jesus didn't have long hair. Anything else, you know, along those lines, God's word tells you exactly what he wants you to wear. He said he wants guys to look like guys and girls to look like girls. Shocker. That's amazing, isn't it? You say, Pastor, you haven't been preaching for three Sundays. I know, I'm just getting re uh, ready to go. Jesus wore pants, not a dress. All right? He did not wear a dress. Dresses are for girls. So, so what am I saying in this? Jesus was not a sissy. He was not a cross-dresser. He was not a transvestite. He was a man's man. He was a manly man. The thing is, is that everything he did about him, and you know what? This is the reason why I think for the most part that there are more women in church than there are men. And I'm not, you know, saying, hey, ladies, leave the church. I am not saying that. I am saying the reason, this is the reason why I believe that there are more women, in, you know, in churches across, you know, across the board than there are men. Because for the most part, men have been told that Jesus is this wussy guy. That he, he wears a dress, you know, he goes around and he, you know what, I even saw this. This is what irritated me. I saw this at, uh, um, and I knew that it was going to be, you know, it was, it's, you know, I found out later it was put on by Mormons, and I'm going, oh, that's, you know, that's the reason why. Um, the, the Jesus thing over at uh, Sight and Sound Theater, I found out, for the most part, they were somewhat accurate, all right? But Jesus comes out, and he's wearing, a, he's, he's in a man bun. I'm like, Jesus, you know, wearing, he has a man bun? I said, any, and I told you this before, any time that you have to put the word man in front of it, it's not manly. It's like, a, I got a man bag. No, you got a purse. That's what you got. 
I got a, I got a, you know, I got a man bun. No, you're a woman with long hair. That's what you got. That's what, you know, that's what it is. All right. And you have ones out there going, I, how dare you? There's some big, I know there's some big guys out there having man buns that still have a woman's haircut. I don't care. But the thing is, is that you put, you know, man in front of it, it's not manly anymore. But the thing is, is that for, you know, for some, yes, Jesus was mild and meek. He was. He was a mild and meek man. He didn't go out looking to pick fights. He wasn't going around doing all that. I'm not saying that's how, you know, a real man should be anyways. He should be meek and mild. They shouldn't be out, like, looking for fights, you know, barroom brawling and everything else. But Jesus is also one who overthrew tables. He went into the temple, overthrew tables. Why? Because they, uh, the money cha- uh, changers were selling sacrifices. And he got angry with the religious leaders and false teachers and preachers of the day. This is somebody, something different than what is mostly taught at churches nowadays. They always say that Jesus is this like wuss out, you know, out in the field just going, you know, picking dandelions all day. No, Jesus was a man's man. He did things. He was a carpenter by trade. That's what his, his uh, stepfather, you know, taught him. Because, you know, Joseph is not his dad, right? Joseph is his stepdad because, you know, God's his father, all right? And so, but when we look at all this stuff, we see all these reasons you know, why fathers and, and men, you know, they're not leading their families, they're not leading their homes, because of why? Because as a nation, we have decided, you know, to, to push ultra-feminism to where, you know, uh, women are at the forefront and doing everything, saying, I can do everything a man's supposed to. You know what? Ladies, let me uh, put, it, you know, put it to you this way. Whereas you may be able to do everything that a man's able to do, which is not true in that statement, because there are some things that men can do that women can't do. God gave you certain roles and says, you know what, in certain things, and says, you are to do those things. Why do you think there's, a, you know, why do you think there's so much um, issue right now with, um, you know, the way that, you know, all these women, they're unsatisfied? Because what? They're not doing what God has asked them to do. They're not doing how God has designed them to be. They're wanting, they're like, I can do anything a man can do. That may be true, but you're not supposed to. Well, pastor, you're a barbarian. How dare you, you savage? How dare you be that way? No. God gave you know, men roles and women roles. And he says, you know what? Men are supposed to do this and women are supposed to do that. And if you have a problem with it, take it up with God because he's the one who wrote it. You're not, you know, ladies, you're not supposed to be doing stuff that, you know, uh, you know, all the stuff that men do. And men, you're not supposed to be doing all the things you know, every, you know, thing that women do. Here's the thing. I can guarantee that there's something you know, that a woman can do that men you can't do. Give birth and praise the Lord. Amen. I, there ain't no way. I mean, you know, and you know, trying to think of something that men can do that women can't, but the thing is, is that, you know what, they could probably do it, but they shouldn't. You know, because the, even the Bible you know, says this. And here's the thing is, is that, you know, to prove even more so that, you know, God is not just this, you know, pansy sitting out there, you know, picking daffodils all day, all right? Exodus chapter 15, verse 3 says this, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. He's a man of war. God fights for you, right? He fights on your behalf. He fights on, on behalf of the believers. Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 18, 34, and also 2 Samuel uh, twenty-two thirty-five. 35, they say the same thing. It says, he teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. This is David speaking. David is saying that God, God is the one who taught him how to war. His hands out of war. Psalm 144, verse 1 says, blessed be, uh, blessed, blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Now you're saying, you know, I thought you said that, you know, that, you know, God wasn't about you, like, fighting anybody or anything else. No, God is saying if there is a righteous war or there's something that you're defending your family, God is saying go ahead and do it. Why? Because I'm the one who taught you to do that. You should, you know, be standing up for your family. You should be standing up, you know, for the, for the innocent. You should be standing up, you know, for those that can, you know, uh, help themselves. You should be. And he says, as a man, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And any man, you know, because, you know, a woman's all of a sudden going, you know what, you know, all of a sudden hides behind a woman, to me, is less of a man. You say, well, what happens if a woman knows how to fight and the man doesn't? The man should at least have some guts to, you know, try and stand up and fight. Maybe the woman can help him along, but he shouldn't, you know, be hiding behind her saying, okay, yeah, go take care of him, honey. See, man, pastor came back and he's like all of a sudden like this, like this male chauvinist pig. No, I'm talking about what the Bible says about these things. So 
So on that, we know that God, you know, that, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, is a manly man, that he, he trains our hands for war. He's not a sissy. You know what? Uh, you know, he, he had, you know, short hair. He wore pants. You know, he did all this stuff. He was a carpenter by trade. He's these things. And I'm not going to go into greater detail on these things. But the next part is, is the part, and I told you this, you know, at the beginning, but you know what? I stopped myself because I didn't want to get ahead of myself. Is this next one. He, you know, just for you, and this may be a shocker for you, his name is Jesus. And you say, well, why are you saying that, Pastor? Because there's this false ideology, this false stupid movement going around saying that we are to call, and this is especially in the Christian music industry, but also it's a damnable heresy and it's the fact of calling God Yahweh and calling Jesus Yeshua. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And it is the most damnable heresy I can think of. Do you know why? Because the fact is there is no other name by which we must be saved than by the name of Jesus Christ. And if we're calling him somebody else, then we're not saved. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, none, if, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given by men, whereby we must be saved. If, if Satan can change the name of who you're saved by, he's got you. If we say, all of a sudden we say, well, you know, I need to call on Yeshua to get saved. No, you don't. And then we go through it, and you say, well, pastor, you know, where's this coming from? That's the sign that says, you know what? It said, Yeshua can save you. Call this number. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. There cannot be this many people out there, you know, you know that are this ignorant of these things. And some of you may have heard this, and the thing is that you may be ignorant of these things because you say, well, somebody said, you know, this, and somebody said that about this, and I'm going to go through some of these things this morning and, put, you know, and hopefully put this, you know, uh, this, this damnable heresy to rest. Yahweh, let's start off with that one. Because this is one that starts off in the Old Testament. This is a, the false name for God, the Father in the Old Testament. Yahweh was a false god. Now, you know, some people say, well, which, which false god was he? You know, there's some discrepancy about that. Well, the thing is, is that I have read anywhere from that he is an ancient storm god to the fact that he is an ancient Canaan, uh, Canaanite uh, desert god to the fact where Yahweh had a wife named Asheroth. Okay, think about it. Who is Asheroth in the Bible? It's often represented, it's representative of Satan. So God married Satan? And to the fact that, you know, they go, well, you know what? The, you know, it's, it's found all over in Israel, and it says that the Israelites worshipped Yahweh. Let me take the long and short of this, that, you know, that this is somehow the proof that, this, that Yahweh is the God of the Bible. Let me make this fast and quick, and then I'll go into further detail. If you, re, uh, you know, read the Old Testament at any point in your life, you'll realize the Israelites didn't always worship the God of the Bible, that they worshiped pagan gods. And that's what got them in trouble. So the fact that they find, like, you know, these monuments or headstones saying that Yahweh and Asheroth are together, and that's his wife, proves the fact that they were doing what? That they were not faithful to, the God, you know, to God, that they were following false gods. That should let people know that. But most people sit there and go, well, it has to be true. God must have a wife. That's how Jesus came about. <gasps> no. Read your Bible. You'll find all this stuff out. Here's the thing. This is uh, by a doctor. I forgot, his, uh, I forgot the doctor's name. I should have wrote it down, but I did not. It says, that the origins of uh, Yahweh worship... It appears that this cult was established by Deborah. We read about, we read about uh, Deborah in the Bible in, uh, in Acts. It says, Thus Yahweh appears as an old deity of Sinai, revered in untold in, uh, iniquity as a weather god. Now the thing is, is that where they come along here and they'll say, well, this is God, that he has to be a, a desert god or a storm god or a weather god or whatever god, is because... Every time that the Israelites tried to worship some, uh, you know, another God, other than the God of the Bible, other than who God is, what ended up happening? God proved that he was God by destroying their, you know, their false little uh, you know, deity. Think back, you know, think back to the Exodus. As they're, you know, all that leading up to it, what does he do? He brings out all kinds of famines and pestilences, right? Brings out gnats and, you know, whatever, darkens the sun and all that. Do you know what that is in regards to? That is going against every single false god that the Egyptians believed in. He blackens out the sun. You know why? Because they worship the sun god, Ra. 
actually is Amun-Ra. He blackens it out to say, you know what? Here's your, here's your pitiful little God. I can darken the sun anytime I want to. Oh, well, Amun-Ra must not be that great of a God if there's a better God out there. And he goes on and he does, oh, you believe in the river God. I'm going to turn that to blood. Oh, wait, yes, I'm bigger than your God of the river too. And he goes on and on and on. And every single time that he does these things, like being the storm God or the desert God, he's always proving himself to be you know, more you know, than their false deity, which is not a real God at all. The Bible even says that there's only one God, and that is it. All these other ones are false gods or imaginations of man trying to rebel against God. And so for the fact that people sit there and say, well, Yahweh, Yahweh, no, it's not Yahweh. And I get tired of, you know, uh, turning on like, you know, Christian radio and I hear a song about Yahweh and I'm like, why don't you just go worship, you know, uh, you know uh, why don't you just go worship Satan? That's ba- basically what you're doing. Because you know why? And I'm going to get into the fact of why, where this came up from, especially it's all in modern scholarship nowadays. I also have to drink every so often because I get a tickle in my throat and then I start coughing. And coughing, it does not, you know, coughing hurts in your abdomen area when that, you know, so, I have to remember that. So how, you know, like I said, I already, you know, you know told you, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, how do I prove this one is wrong is the fact that they worship a lot of false gods. Here's the other thing is, is that they are also basing off a language that doesn't use vowels, all right? Now, what do I mean by that? When you come... And I'm not going to try and go into, you know, super deep into this and everything else. But when you come to the original writing, the letters that come up, you know, in the, well, in the Hebrew language, there are no vowels. All right? So if you're, you know, into Hebrew, there are no vowels. So you kind of got to guess, you know, a little bit on this, some of this stuff. But they come up to it, and there's these letters for God. And it says, you know, in ours, it would be Y-H-V-H. So most manuscripts have this rendering. They say that, that this is the name of God. These are the letters that we have for the name of God the Father. There's no vowels, but the majority of you know, manuscripts, like I said, give this rendering of that one, while a couple out there, there's like, like two or three of them that give the rendering Y-H-W-H. Okay? Now you can see you know, a little bit where this is kind of going is that they give that rendering. So why? Because you know what? Here's the variance between the two. And this is the funny reason why there's the two, the, the, the two different uh, spellings of this, or that one letter is different than the other. The Hebrew vav is pronounced as a V, not a W. This is the same doctor that I was telling you about, you know, that does Bible translation. It says, this error came about due to the misreading of German Hebrew grammar which uses W for the English V. So in other words, as they were trying to translate, they wrote down what the Germans had uh, written as a W, and yet that W is actually a V in English. So they got it wrong there. And then the thing is, is that also, here's a special little note, the German V is actually pronounced with the English F. So if they actually were to actually come out there and come out with their own little personal saying of what they had to say, they should probably not call him Yahweh. They should call him Yof. Can you imagine going up? I believe in Yof. But the whole thing is, is that, so like I said, the first rendering of, you know, the, the, the Y-H-V-H, uh, v, uh, that whole thing is the, is the pronunciation of Jehovah. How are they doing? How do we know that it is Jehovah? Well, we don't. We only have the letters. When they are pronouncing Jehovah, they are pronouncing, they're taking each of those letters and pronouncing it. And if you, if you look at each one of those letters, as you say it, it says, that, you know, it says like Jehovah. It's, each one is like Je, and then Ho, and then Va, and then V. You know, so it has that all, all the, the Hebrew letters. So all they're doing is pronouncing the Hebrew letters together. And they came up with the name Jehovah. Because they don't know what the vowels are. So to me, this is a more accurate reading. The fact is that they're just writing down what they're given, right? But the other one, the one that has the, you know, Y, H, W, you know, H, that one is only backed by, like I said, by a couple of uh, modern, or a couple of modern, you know, manuscripts, and most, you know, modern scholars superimpose vowels that they think are correct, 
So they come up with Yahweh. But the thing is, is that if they were to look up the Hebrew, you know, uh, that, that, you know, the Y can actually, you know, be you know, pronounced as a Ya or a Ja. So you have Jehovah. And they can actually, you know, go along with this, this whole the other part. They should actually call them, you know, uh, uh, Jawaf, if they want to actually get it right the way that they, they, they've written it. Okay? Like I said, I don't want to go any really in, any much more deeper into it because it gets into a whole lot of other, you know, parts of it. But the whole fact is, is that I believe that when, they, you know, they write in their Jehovah, that is the correct rendering because all they're doing is going off of the letters that are given to them. And they're not trying to superimpose their, their own vowels and trying to make up a name. And the name that they picked up was a name for, you know, a pagan deity. Good job. Way to go, scholars. You picked up a pagan deity and you're trying to say that that's the God of the Bible. This stuff is easy to find online, too. I mean, I, you know, it's just, it's, it, you know, it's pretty easy. The next one is Yeshua. If you ever, I don't know if anybody's ever heard somebody say, you need, you know, you need, a, it's not Jesus, it's Yeshua. We got it wrong. Has anybody ever heard that one? By a show of hands? Yeshua? That one's becoming more and more popular. All right. Well, for one thing, the name of Jesus is historically accurate and reliable. It's been that way ever since, you know, ever, ever since it's been. Yeshua is never used in the Bible nor in the Greek. So if you, the reason why I bring up the Greek why is because the New Testament was originally written in Greek, right? Don't you think that if, if Yeshua was his name that they would have wrote it in Greek that way? But they don't. The name Yeshua was actually invented in the 1800s. It's actually invented around 1880, 1882 that they came up with this name. And here's the thing, you know, before I get any farther, if Satan knows that there's one name to call upon to be saved, wouldn't he try to confuse that? If Jesus knows that there, I'm sorry, if Satan knows that there's only one name by which you can be saved, wouldn't he try to mess that up? Because Yahshua is not going to save you. Yahweh is not going to save you. Jesus is going to save you. And so when we look at this, you know, whole thing, like, like I said, not going to go try to go into, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, deep stuff on, around this. But in the Greek, Jesus' is, uh, Jesus's name is translated as Jesus, uh, okay, or Jesus in our language. Because, you know, they'll look at that because there's an I, it's I-E-S-O-U-S, as, as far as in Greek it says, Jesus. Um, uh, but... And so we'll go on, just like in Spanish, we, you know, Spanish people don't call him, you know, Jesus, do they? They call him Jesus. In German, they call him Jesus. Okay, so we have all these different, you know, uh, you know times, but the thing is, is that the name is universal in every language. It's the same name. No matter which name you go in, the name is still the same name. It's Jesus in any language. All right? And so no matter what, it's pronounced differently in different languages, but they sound familiar, right? The ones that I, I told you sound familiar. And, uh, but it's the name that is above every name. And like I said, modern Hebrew was invented in the 1800s, right around the 1880s. Now, are you beginning to notice a trend about the 1880s? There's a lot of things that happened in the 1880s to Bible, uh, Bible scholarship and, and Bible manuscripts and everything. I talked to you about a year and a half ago about the fact of having the right Bible and making sure that you have a Bible, you know, that, uh, that follows the Codex, uh, sorry, the uh, Textus Receptus and not the Codex, uh, Codex Vaticanus or Sinaiticus. Do you know why? Because in 1882 was the time that they found those manuscripts and they began to translate. Do you begin to see a trend that all this stuff right around this time is the fact is that they begin to change things about what God's Word says. They begin to change it over and over again. And the thing is, is that I can tell you this. All the, all, the, all the versions that came out of these at the beginning were rejected. Do you know why? Because people knew the truth. People know what their Bible says, and they knew that there were verses missing. They knew that there were words changed. They knew that there were words and verses missing, and they knew that. But the thing is that now, nowadays, we look at it, and we began to accept certain Bibles. Is there a re- Do you know there's a reason why that Bible translations change every couple of years? is because somebody digs up some, some new scrap, uh, scrap piece of paper in the dirt. And that one says something a little bit differently than the other one said, so we're going to go along with the new one that we just found. And I've told you, that, you know, there are scholars out there that say, you know what, if we find a portion of Scripture that does not include, like, say, John 3.16, they'll say, you know what, we'll take it out. I say John 3.16 because that's probably, you know, the, the most famous Bible, uh, Bible verse out there, right? 
But they say, you know what, we need to go with, because we don't really know. Nothing in their mind is settled. And these modern scholars, nothing in the Bible is settled. But I can tell you this, that God has preserved his word. God has preserved his word, you know, you know back, you know, uh, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. God preserved his word. He didn't sit there and say, well, you know what, I, you know, just wait until the newest edition comes out. Then you'll know what God wants. And I've told you this before, that every single you know, Bible version that is out there now contradicts not only the other versions, but contradicts the old version that it just came you know, to update. I told you that the NIV itself contradicts itself over and over again. One of the spots is, is that it says in, in Matthew, it says that, um, that, that Jesus had compassion upon the people. That's the first rendering of it in 1984. Well, now in the 2011, it says Jesus was indignant with the people. So was Jesus indignant or did he have compassion? Those are not, those are not you, know, uh, you know, parallel or, you know, uh, uh, synonymous, you know, feelings. You can't have compassion and be, be angry at somebody. So I would, you know, again, say check the translation that you have and see where it's coming from. And there is a standard that they're going off. There is a standard Bible that they're going off of, and yet they never use it. That's another sermon for another day. I wasn't planning on going into all the extra stuff. I was actually thought that my voice would have given out and I would have let you guys out before noon. But the Lord is good, amen? Got a little quiet on that one. Some were like, oh man, lunch. So modern Hebrew was invented because here's the thing. Modern Hebrew, like I said, was invented in the 1800s, right around 1880 actually. It was a dead language for over a thousand years. It actually was a dead language from A.D. 100 to 1882. Can you see the reason why Greek all of a sudden became, you know, uh, you know, the language of choice? Because we still have Greek nowadays. And people will say, well, that's Koine Greek. It's different than the Greek we have nowadays. But I can tell you this. If you were to go give a Greek New Testament and, you know, the Texas Receptus, Greek New Testament, to a Greek-speaking person, one who has grown up in Greece, they are still able to read it. They'll say, you know what, there's a couple of things that they weren't really able to, you know, um, that are, are different, but they can figure it out. So the stuff that they're teaching at Bible college and the stuff they're teaching you or whatever, they actually sit there and will say, you know what, every time that they, they pronounce biblical Greek, they're speaking a different language because that language never existed. This is a person that speaks Greek that will say that to you. But they are, but that, you know, say, well, how do you know that? Well, they're able to read, you know, the Koine Greek, the biblical Greek nowadays and understand it. So basically, it's a big lie going on, you know, the fact, you know, that there's something different, you know, that that language is a dead language and we need the scholars to help us understand it. No, you don't. It's already been, it's already been figured out for you a long time ago. Like I said, I'm going, I'm deeping it off of my stuff here. All right. So the thing is, is that if, Modern Hebrew was, you know, is, has, was reinvented in the 1800s. It's not the same Hebrew that was used in the writing of the Old Testament. They are guessing how modern Hebrew actually is. They have no idea how it actually sounded in the Old Testament. They have no idea. They have no clue. Modern scholars have no idea. So if you think the ones, you know, the guys over at the Wailing Wall bobbing back and forth or the, I'm sorry, I wasn't having Miss Tanya laughing at this one, but if you didn't think the, you know, the, the, you know, the white guys at the Willing Wall bobbing back and forth or whether curly cues going back and forth are actually Jewish, they're not. And you think they're actually speaking Hebrew, they're not. They're, 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 they're going off of a reinvented Hebrew that they don't even know is actually, if that's actually even you know, the real Hebrew. But I can tell you this, the ones that translated the Bible originally, they not only knew Greek, they knew Hebrew, they knew like uh, Aramaic, they knew Chaldean, they... There, there's, there was guys that knew 20 plus languages. And I say knew, it's not the fact that they had like, you know, just a kind of, you know, there's one guy that said that he, he did not even know what his mother tongue was because of the fact that he knew the other languages so well. That he could switch back and forth between different languages without even knowing that he was switching out of a language. That's the one that wrote the Bible. You know, he was one of 54 that wrote the Bible. And the other ones were the same way. They got, you know, the best scholars along, you know, on there. So Hebrew being a dead language for a thousand years, like I said, no one knows how to pronounce all that stuff, uh, how to pronounce anything in Hebrew today, let alone in the 1800s. 
But the leaders of this movement will say that the name of Jesus is a pagan name. They'll say Yeshua is the name. Jesus' name, you know, they messed it up when they translated the Bible. So for one thing, you're telling me that you've had thousands of translators, thousands of scholars, you know, look at the Bible and translate it, and they got it all wrong, but somehow you got it right and called, it, you know, called them Yeshua. And here's the other part, you know, that's really funny, is the fact that they'll say that, well, you know what, the New Testament was actually written in Hebrew. Well, let's look at the evidence. There are five, over 5,900 manuscripts in Greek for the New Testament. Do you know how many you know, uh, New, uh, New Testaments are written in Hebrew? Zero. So where is this, you know, fantasy, um, you know, manuscript that they're coming up and saying, well, it was actually written. And they'll come try and say, well, it was written in uh, Hebrew originally, but then they translated it to Greek. That's why they messed it up. They said because Jesus was, uh, you know, was Jewish, so naturally he spoke Hebrew. Well, naturally he didn't. You say, well, pastor, how do you know that? Well, let me see here. Jesus, you know, uh, a lot of countries apart from the United States speak more than one language. Because in the United States, we think that we're the best. We, everybody has to speak English. We don't have to learn another language, right? So, but in other countries, they not only know their native tongue, but they'll know English because English is pretty much universal everywhere, right? Plus, they'll know another language. Like in Africa, they'll have like their, their village language, but then they'll have the national language, and then they'll have another language that they learn along with it, which a lot of times is English. So they'll learn like at least three languages, okay? So Jesus grew up where? Where did Jesus grow up? Galilee, right? Galilee is a Greek-speaking area. So why would Jesus, you know, yes, he's, you know, he grew up to, uh, you know, Jewish parents and everything, but why would he grow up speaking Hebrew when the fact is, is that he grew up in a, in a, in a Greek-speaking area? Yes, I'm not denying the fact that he probably didn't know Hebrew because he probably, you know, he went to synagogue, he read the scriptures, he read all those things, but he probably knew a, a lot more than just, you know, one language. And the thing is, is that, why, and you say, well, how can you prove that, that, uh, that there was no chance of it being written in Hebrew? Well, think about the areas that the, that the apostles went to to go, uh, to go preach the gospel. Every place that, they, you know, that we have a letter to is written to a Greek-speaking area. Thessalonica, Greece. Corinth, uh, Corinth Greece. I mean, all these different places you know, that you have and other places, that, you know, say, well, those are not. They were Greek-speaking as well. So why would, you know, uh, why would all of a sudden the apostles go, oh man, I know I only know Hebrew. Whew. I think I should start writing in Greek. They already knew it. And so the thing is, is for, you know, for us to sit there and, and think about, you know, because you know, the whole Yeshua thing is like, oh, we need to go back to what his Hebrew name was. Well, you know what, when they translate it, you know, uh, you know when it's in the Greek, what, do they, what, what, what name do they put down? Jesus which translates to what? Jesus. Yeshua is not in there at all. God doesn't want to, you know, God wants us you know, to call upon one name, the only name that, you know, whereby we must be saved, and that name is Jesus, over and over again. 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 22 says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Acts 4.18 says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Who were these people? that were denying you know, that Jesus is the Christ, that were saying, don't speak in the name of Jesus. Don't speak or teach. Who were the ones? The Jews. You say, well, I thought the Jews loved Jesus. No, they don't. My thing is, is that you have, everybody's like, well, you know, I met a Messianic Jew. Why would you want to be called a Messianic Jew? Why don't you just be called a Christian like they were in the Bible? You're not supposed to be doing Jewish stuff anymore. Why? Because that's all ceremonial. And Jesus had done away with that. Why are you going to go around, you know, uh, you know wearing, you know, I was going to call it what I normally call it, but I'll, I'll be nice. Why are you going to go around wearing a yarmulke, having your curly cues and everything else, asking that you're, you know, acting like you're still Jewish? You're not Jewish. If you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a believer, you are a Christian, you are to leave the Jewish things behind. Why? Because you know what? The Jews are the ones that are always trying to get people to go back to what? Judaism. 
The thing is, is that a person that says, I'm a Messianic Jew, needs to learn, you know what? No, you're not. If you believe on Jesus Christ, you are a believer. Because oftentimes, the ones that are saying that they're Messianic Jews want you to believe that you should call him Yeshua. He is not Yeshua. He is Jesus. If God wanted us to, you know, for us to call him Yeshua, he would have put it in the, uh, in the Bible. But yet, there's no case of it at all. The last thing, and this one will be short. Like I said, I was supposed to be done 15 minutes ago. They'll make this final argument. This is the final dagger in their argument. You remember how I spelled the name of Jesus? I-E-S-O-U-S. Well, they'll say when it's transliterated, you know, that, you know, that comes out, it says I-E-S-U-S. J didn't exist, so they messed it up. In their words, they'll say that when they translate it, that they have bastardized the name of God. And they say, you know what, it's an I there, that's why it's Yeshua and it's not Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard this argument, I have. I've heard this argument over and over again. Well, they'll say, you know what? Do you know that the, the J wasn't invented until the, you know, the, the 1600s? And, and they'll go down that route. But you know what? Here the thing is. His name was still pronounced the same way in every language. The people that translated the Bible didn't just go off of the Greek manuscripts. They also went off of, you know, off of the Spanish Bible and the Russian Bible and all these different languages that are all around because, you know what, they wanted to make sure that when they wrote the Bible that it was the most accurate, that it wasn't just their bias or anything else that they were trying to read into the text. They went and they got other translations in other languages and went against what God's Word says. They wanted to make sure that it was right. And in every name, uh, in every language, it is still pronounced what? Jesus. So the fact that they want to bring up that stupid argument that the UJ wasn't, and it's true, it was not. Their argument has somewhat validity. It was not invented until the 1600s. Why? Because English was still a new language. The English language didn't come around until like the 14, you know, uh, 1450s, I believe. And it was based off, you know, uh, mostly based off of Latin. And so it was evolving and you know, it became a different language. We see that you know, nowadays with a lot of things. Like you go, if you know Spanish, I'm learning a little bit of Spanish, I'm doing a little Duolingo, all right? The word I in, in Spanish, like for me, you know, I, is yo. You go to a different area that speaks Spanish and it'll say yo. Is it a different name? You know, did I say something different? No, it's the same thing. It's just the fact of how they change it in different areas. So where I say, you know, I would say yo, they would say yo. Just like you hear sometimes, you know, you hear somebody that, you know, that, that is Hispanic, they'll come on and say yes or no. Because the Y or the I, because the Y and the I are made the same, you know, the same sound, it all depends on where, you know, where you're at. But the thing is, is that it's the name above everything. It's still the same name as Jesus. There's no way you get Yeshua out of it. There's no way. And here's the thing is that they'll come out there and they'll talk about that, about how it was an I and not a J and that the name of Jesus is wrong, but they don't go on to look at how it was originally translated for Jews. Do you know how you spelled Jews the way that they spelled, uh, spelled it back, you know, back at that time? I-E-W-E-S. But you know what? You know how it was pronounced? Jews. So why is there no, nobody ever bring up the fact that Jews is actually, you know, uh, you know, said with an I, and so is Jesus, you know, is spelled with an I, but yet they have a problem with the fact that how Jesus is spelled originally, but yet it was changed later on because obviously the English language changes a little bit, and they have a problem with that. So I, like I said, I believe that Jesus spoke Greek along with Aramaic and Hebrew and probably Latin. Why? Because you have the Roman soldiers that were speaking Latin as well. And there's a reason, you know, you have on the cross, you have it written in what? Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Those three times it says King of the Jews. Like I said, there are over 5,900 manuscripts, all in Greek, none in Hebrew. So if you get a Hebrew roots movement person coming up to you, because they are around here. They're the ones that want you to become a, uh, basically a Jew. 
The Bible refers to them as Judaizers. And they want you to go back to being, you know, they want you to leave the name of Jesus behind because one of the things they'll have you do when they go to the sacred name movement, that's what it's called, the sacred name movement, but they're, they, they call it, you know, the, the Hebrew roots movement. They also have the black Hebrew roots movement. All right? But it's a sacred name movement, and they say it's Yeshua, and you should do all this other stuff. But one of the first things they will have you do if you want to be a part of their group, part of their cult, is that you have to deny the name of Jesus and call him Yeshua. So tell me who's right and who's wrong. The fact that they're trying to get you to change his name. And the fact is, do you want to know the difference between the two, the, the black Hebrew roots and the regular Hebrew roots? <clears throat> Hebrew roots basically is that they want to turn you into a Jew. The, you know, the black Hebrew roots is basically they want to turn you into a black Jew because they teach in, in the fact, what they say is that all people that have dark skin, that you know, is nowadays as we would refer to as an African-American, that they are actually all Israelites and that they are all oppressed and they are actually all God's chosen people. Show me where that's in the Bible. Leave all the, you know, you know, the victimizing you know, and all that kind of stuff because all they're trying to do is play the victim that's, you know, of this movement. That's all they want. They want to make it look like you know, a certain race of people has been victimized. And they bring it all back to like slavery and all that kind of stuff. If you want to know the truth, every single skin color in this room and that's not in this room, that is, you know, or ever across the, the earth, every single uh, skin color has been a slave at one point or time or another. Do you know why? Because there was wars. And you know what? The winner of the war got to keep doing what they wanted to do, and the losers of the war became slaves. Wow, that's a history lesson. You know, I, I miss preaching the last three weeks. So here's my, the ultimate question we must ask on this question, on this entire thing. For one thing, I already said, you know, according to, like I said, these heretics, that scholars and, and, and translators, according to them, have gotten it wrong for 2,000 years. That God didn't know what he was doing. So my question to you is, did God preserve his word or not? Because God's word says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass. God promised that he would preserve his word, but according to them, it's always shifting, like these modern scholars and all these false religions, everything is shifting. Why? The reason why they, want, you know, they don't want anything to be settled in the canon of Scripture is because then, in that way they can change it. Because they can go in there and change it. And like I, I taught you about this before, that the modern manuscripts that they use, mainly for the Bible translations, they don't use the ones that... Um, that was actually the received text. That's actually what re, re, uh, Texas Receptus means, is the received text. It was received from generation to generation to generation. It wasn't, oh man, we don't have the Bible. We got to go dig it up. That's what modern scholarship teaches. That we don't know what God's word really says until we go up and dig it up. The only religion out there that believe, you know, that takes you know, uh, scripture and says, hey, you know what? We believe it's actually living, like it's alive, like literally alive, not just like, you know, metaphorically, but literally alive, is the Jewish faith. And whether or not they actually wrote it correctly or not. So when they wrote it correctly, they'll keep those, but they still will, will do what with it? They will bury it. And when they, uh, and they wrote it down wrong, they will do the same thing. They will bury it because they believe it's literally alive and that you must bury the dead. So what do you think that they are, you know, when they're doing these archaeological digs to, quote-unquote, find the real word of God and find out what it really says, what are they digging up? They're not digging up God's word. They're digging up all the false versions that are out there. This, this morning actually was not really about, this, about the fact of really finding the real Jesus, but somehow we became the whole thing about finding the right Bible. But the thing is, is that we got to realize that the world around us is not going to present the gospel or present Jesus the correct way. He's not how he is on The Chosen. It's a weird show. It's really super weird. The fact that Mormons and Catholics both funded that together, that should tell you something about The Chosen. How Hollywood and how the mainstream and all that present Jesus is not how he really is. He didn't have long hair. He didn't wear a dress. He wasn't a transvestite, all right? 
He wasn't confused. He only said, oh, you know what? You guys got to, you know, you know, follow what I said, except for me. I can do whatever I want because I'm God. I can do whatever I want. I can change my mind every time I want to. Oh, and, you know, my name is a pagan God's name, you know, Yahweh. No. Or, you know what? People got it wrong all the time. His name's not Jesus. It's, you know, Sh- you know Yeshua. I say that because I know, I know people in this room that have this really close to them. Especially the fact that about the whole Yeshua Hebrew roots thing and the black Hebrew roots thing. I've seen, that, I've seen that come out time and time and time again because they'll come out there and say, you know what, his real name is not, and they'll come out and start, they start talking to you. But the thing is, here's the way that they evangelize, and I, I end with this, I'm sorry. I said that a couple times now, but <clears throat> I'm just pushing it back. When a sacred name movement, Hebrew roots, black Israelite, will evangelize, do you know what name they tell them to use instead of Yeshua because they, they said that most people won't listen to it? They tell them, go, uh, go up there and say, you know, uh, go up there and call, um, call him Jesus. We'll, we'll fix him later. So they don't, they themselves believe that, you know, that we've gotten the, you know, the wrong name for all these thousands of years, got the name wrong, but yet when they're evangelizing, trying to get somebody to convert to their stupid religion, what do they do? They say, well, yeah, just call him Jesus. Because people will understand that that's more palatable. That's what a cult does. A cult will sit there and tell you something and then change it on you about halfway through to all of a sudden get you to, you know, to their way of believing. That's what they do. They sit there and say, well, just call him Jesus. We'll correct him later. That's what a cult does. And that's what, you know, and they're, like I said, they're in Carothersville. I know that they are. I've met them. There's actually, and I'll say this, there's actually a pastor whose brother believes this. That should be a note, you know, something of worth. Be careful who you marry, single people. Because it has a profound effect on what you believe later on in life. I've gone longer than I, you know, than I was you know, supposed to, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, that, you know, that shows us 100% accuracy of who you are. Lord, that, God, that you are who you say you are. God, that you are Jesus. You are Jehovah. You are you know, uh, what your word says. That it wasn't mistranslated. It wasn't you know, uh, uh, translated wrong. That it wasn't bastardized. It wasn't any of those things. But your word is pure and holy. And Lord, it shows us who you are and how to believe and who to believe in. Because we know that there is no other name uh, under heaven by which we must be saved than Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that those that within the sound of my voice, whether they are here in person or online, Lord, would, uh, if they are believing, you know, these false, you know, ideologies and false, you know, damnable heresies, that they would uh, leave them, they would repent of them, and that they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, One last thing, remember, uh, you know, tonight at 5 o'clock we have our prayer meeting and also First Youth. Until then, you know, God bless you. You are dismissed.